two minutes, and I have a bit of a comment. And that's really really brief. Really yeah. Brief, two minutes. I can, I'm used to uh, time limits. My name is Dave Soper. I'm professor of physics at the university. Uh, I have what's relevant for the health issues here for the microwaves is uh, electricity and magnetism and quantum mechanics. And I have taught both of those multiple times at the graduate level. And I do research but, uh, in physics, but it's not on this subject. Uh, I looked a little bit at what I could find about this subject. And I can tell you that the evidence we heard here is just fine, but there are hundreds of papers about health effects of microwave radiation. And not all of them are saying that there are health effects. Many of them say that they are not. And there's good reasons from the point of view of physics to think that there should not be health effects at the levels of you would get from walking around a cell phone tower. So I, can, I could go on for a long time about that, but I think there's lots of people who would like to talk. Uh, my impression from a political point of view is that there are dangers in the world that we need to be concerned about. Uh, one of them is polluting our atmosphere with carbon dioxide and heating up the planet. That is a major da uh, danger and almost all scientists agree about it. Not very many scientists agree about this issue. Thank you. Why is it that so many insurance companies are refusing to insure cell tower properties? Why are many of the cell tower contracts being brought out by LLC companies promising big money? Why are most of the cell towers in the United States being leased with an option to buy to a company called Crown Castle of, of Texas? Why is it that even the applicants for cell towers are sometimes using a variety of names. Everyone from the insurance companies to the cell tower companies and even the applicants seem very concerned about liability. I am concerned also. There is too much at stake in regards to health and loss of property value not to be well informed on this issue. My neighborhood is not for sale to the highest bidder. Thank you. Well, and thank you very much. I, I, will, just, um, I will just add that um, the short answer is I don't know the answer to those questions, but I do believe that those are excellent questions to be asked, and they're excellent questions to be asked repeatedly in a variety of places. I will say that one of the interesting things about, again, the idea of reading the application, and I've met with Ms. Allen, and I know you're doing this, but for example, we know there's a lot of fires associated with this, because it's risky. And it's not that that isn't known to the industry, it is known. It's known to the people that write the codes. But there are requirements that, uh, that need to be met in the application process. And so it's a great example, whether it's insurance, whether it's fire code compliance, whether fire, code com whether fire code should be changed as a result of the increasing knowledge of the risk. Uh, all, all of those would be good examples of read the application and try to help strengthen the code uh, that it's done. I, I will mention um, regarding Dr. Soper's comments, one of the things I think is really important on the health side, and again, I am not a health expert, but in terms of the, um, uh, the uh, language that we use about health is that we're prone to jump to uh, what might be the dramatic uh, uh, fears that people have, such as cancer, such as uh, death, such as the, uh, uh, the uh, tower uh, catching on fire because of the heat or whatever. And, and I think what's really important about, and I, I saw some of that tonight in Dr. Dart's materials, I saw a lot more of it in the YouTube that I watched earlier, and that is uh, the idea that health is way, way broader than 
than death, than morality, uh, mortality, than, than uh, the, uh, uh, the number of people that, that die or the number of rats that die or whatever. It, it really has to do with the aggravation, the stress, the uh, other measurable health impacts that are not as, um, as, as, as dramatic or as uh, dramatic as the word cancer, and yet they are, in my view, very valuable reasons to take a close scrutiny at, at this kind of technology. I'm just aware that it's a little bit after eight, so let's, um, we'll go ahead and respond to these people in line here, but let's really concentrate on very brief pointed questions that we can take advantage of our two experts here with, okay? Thanks. Uh, my question is, is that locally there's supposedly these two cell towers that are going in, from my understanding, one over here at this church and one across from my house less than 200 feet away at 39th and Willamette, where I did actively go all around in the neighborhood and tell people that I'm an RN, my son's a physician, I, I really, really believe this does impact health, but as you said, on a national level, we're not allowed, they were not allowed to address that part. It had to be more aesthetics or whatever. But so how can we block this? What can we do? Because that's what we do. We don't, our bodies are over already really working hard with pollution in the environment. Um, the reason that I brought up the law review article is that uh, the standard response is health impacts are not a valid concern right. for local governments in making cell phone tower location decisions. And I'm simply pointing out that there is an alternative view that's out there that the language from the Federal Telecommunications Act uh, does in fact allow for communities to um, use those factors in making decisions. So uh, the short answer is uh, until somebody much higher up than me in the legal scene says don't do it, I would say we need to keep pressing that issue and I wouldn't take no for an answer. Maybe we want to know, though, how. So if you can give us a little, we don't know how. Are you talking about the what? Building? Yeah, what, how do we press the issue? Hello? We're already saying we don't want it. We're going around in our uh, neighborhoods. We're presenting things. We're petitioning things. And yet the people that are doing it, like the man across the street, he's getting 3000 bucks a month to rent this little chunk of land that's less than 200 feet from all of our homes because he's hurting for money. He already put a crematorium in that's putting ashes into the air every day, illegally, by the way, and then had that. So what do we do? He, he, they said they're going to make it look like a big metal tree. One thing you can do is sign up the contact list here, and we'll notify you about future meetings and um, uh, ways that you can get involved with uh, further uh, participation in the, in the project process. My name is Kathy Ging, and I want to encourage all of you to sign up the sign-up list. Folks, this is not going to happen without you. A few of us put hundreds of hours in to get this uh, far in this whole movement. But I just want to say nobody's really brought up the fact that the Real Estate Appraisal, in uh, it's called Appraisal Institute, has said between 2 to 20 percent property devaluation. The closer you get proximity to the cell phone tower, the closer you get to 20 percent devaluation. In uh, the Guardian newspaper over 10 years ago in England said 15 to 25 percent property devaluation and they also said one guy lost 250,000 pounds on his house. And the third point about this is if you go to a website called um, protect PDX, respectpdx.com, there's a respectpdx.com in Portland. It's, a, it's an activist manual for learning how to fight cell phone towers. And the uh, woman up there asked the realtor, she said between 10 to 20 percent property devaluation. I have a personal experience with having a lawyer in my car one time, and she wouldn't get out the car and look at the house. I said, well, why not? And I saw down the street was a cell phone tower. This was way before the cell phone towers are now up to 4 and 5G. And finally, I would just say that um, with one, pro one property in Southeast Eugene went into foreclosure. I, I was trying to show it for a couple years. Finally, it went to foreclosure. I couldn't figure why nobody wanted to look at it. I drove by and I finally showed it to somebody and there was a cell phone tower across the street. I just wanted to uh, quickly add uh, two things. One, thank you, Kathy Ging, for all your great work in the community and 
tireless effort on this issue. Um, and uh, secondly, that the uh, Clackamas County case that I referred to, where the uh, Land Use Board of Appeals uh, overturned Clackamas County's decision to grant a cell phone tower permit, uh, one of the major aspects of that case was realtor testimony that property values would decline. Okay, my name is John Tilking. I just moved here over the summer from San Jose, California. I have one question about the technical aspects of the cell phone tower. I'm wondering how many watts a typical cell phone tower puts out because I want to compare it to a proposed low, F, low power FM station that may go online uh, powered by various activists in the community. I want to compare whether there's a need for a concern about a 100 watt transmitter. You're talking about a 100 watt yeah, FM 100 watt, 100 watt low power FM license. Um, I can't actually answer that question. What I can tell you is that when you get into microwave frequencies, the, the higher frequencies, uh, some research has shown that they cause more voltage fluctuation deeper into tissues, so they have a more potent effect than lower levels. The research that Dr. Paul talks about in showing that EMF alters uh, calcium channel, gated calcium channels, um, there's research showing that all across the electromagnetic spectrum, down to extremely low frequency. Um, so uh, a lot of the question comparing one thing to another is, is difficult to phrase. Ah, and I don't know the answer to that, although once it towers up, you can put more, you can co-locate on it. So uh, AT&T might be putting out a certain power of signal, and then uh, um, Sprint and Verizon will be able to put their transmitters on the same thing, so on the same tower once it's there. I don't know, uh, I don't know if there's one answer to that question. You'd have to go out and measure them. Uh, I'll just add one more thing, and that is when I first started getting into this, I remember asking, well, how much uh, radiation uh, comes off of a cell phone tower? And the answer is zero, okay? The tower itself does not produce any uh, radiation. It's the antenna on the tower, and the number of antenna on the tower is a big issue, and, and Dr. Dart is right. We don't know the answer to that question because we don't know how many antenna are on the tower. My name's Jane Catra. I have three points to make. The cell tower proposed for Fox Hollow and West Amazon is supposed to be filled with little spires because that's what they do with the tree, the ones that look like trees. They have way more spires than the old cell towers. So they're putting out a lot more radio frequency than the old cell towers. And guess what? There's nobody monitoring <laughs> just how much is coming out. I have a friend who does ham radios. And he said that the way they do ham radio stuff here in town is they have the inspector come out and measure how much frequency they're putting out. And once they get their certificate, they are free to just put out as much frequency as they want. Nobody's checking. So the point is, <laughs> there's nobody checking. Number two, uh, there was a community up in a Portland suburb as well as in Connecticut where the local community shamed the minister and the congregation by picketing, women and children picketing, and they finally withdrew the proposal. And this is an option we have. This is a so-called minister who doesn't even live in our neighborhood. This is on my block proposed. He's willing to radiate the children all around, people who live within 100 feet. You know, he doesn't care. He's making thousands a month. And once the cell tower goes up, he can vacate and the tower stays. You can sell your cell tower out for a big bucks, a one-time cash payment because people are buying them. The third thing I really want to say is this proposed tower is right across from the um, Amazon Creek uh, headwaters. It's right across from open space land and the jogging trails that your taxpayer money, over a million dollars of federal and local taxpayer money went to develop the jogging trail and the open space, and on the city website, it says the West Amazon Corridor is going to be developed as an environmental preserve open space 
that people can come to for free and appreciate the nature. Now, the, the, federal, the Department of the Interior last spring wrote a letter, and we have copies of it here, and I also made a flyer here about Amazon corridors for the birds. The data of the danger to the birds is clear. Many, many ways it damages birds. They can't learn their songs, they can't migrate, they can't navigate, their eggshells are uh, break easy, their fertility goes down, on and on. And the, our own U.S. Department of Interior has challenged the Federal Communications Commission for inadequate standards for protecting birds and wildlife. So this is our taxpayer paid open space, the West Amazon Corridor, talked about a lot on the city website. And I feel that it is unconscionable to take our money and build a, an open space for wildlife and then allow the wildlife to be microwaved. Because I think everybody in town notices, I've, I've been here for 40 years, have you noticed how few birds there are? Yeah, and I ride my bike along the Willamette River and since the university put up, or on the, on the Elton Baker Park, two cell towers there, you can see crows and now and then a few other species that there's hardly any birds. You, you ride the whole length between Springfield and Eugene, so it's a bird issue. And this is, another, this is an issue that I think a lot of people can agree on, even if you don't agree on human health, you know. My name is Bill Zwicker, and uh, the, the cell tower issue is one of many that we're facing in terms of dealing with corporations trying to come into our community and do harm to us so that they can make a profit. We have the GMO issue. We have, as, as the professor, the physics professor, what was your name again? Sofer. Sofer. Uh, the uh, global warming problem. We have corporations wanting to come in and take our water out of our rivers and, and bottle it and sell it back to us. Um, there is an organization here. Uh, it's called Community Rights Lane County that's working to uh, draft um, three ballot measures, one of which is, would be to give local communities the power to create ordinances that cannot be over uh, overridden or usurped by either the state or the federal level, as long as they meet certain criteria. Um, they just had a meeting this past Monday, and uh, they are looking for help, and I think it's an important step that we need to take so that when an issue like this comes along, we have a tool in our toolkit to preempt these unjust laws. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, first is for you. Um, we live in an area, we're southeast neighbors, and um, we live in an area that doesn't have very good cell connection at all. And because we use our phones for business and um, just communicating for our work that way, we, we depend on them, we need more coverage up in the area where we're from off of 30th. And I was wondering if your plans, the, I, the meeting said where should cell phone towers be located, and we haven't talked about that. And um, where are, you know, where should they be planned? We need more cell phone coverage in our neighborhood. No, we, but we'd have to get two because we have Verizon and AT&T, and it would be a lot. So where are they supposed to be planned? The, can, the, I, can I just make a quick, quick comment on that? I, I just want to make reinforce that we're not, um, this, this meeting is about what is not about whether or not to have cell towers, it's about location. Right. Location, location, location. And uh, the periphery, the perimeter of residential areas as opposed to embedded within them. And that's, that's the question. Uh, from what I uh, can tell, uh, I would say the best location is the location that is uh, more industrial, uh, less residential, uh, away from people, away from children, away from schools. Uh, and, and I would say one of the reasons I think a strong cell phone uh, tower ordinance would include the duty of the applicant to state the alternative sites that were rejected 
and why were they rejected? So that when the citizens read that application, they don't have to ask the question you're asking. They receive the information of what alternatives were looked at. And that's what bothers me about putting this at a church where there's young people. And also, another thing that was mentioned specifically about this proposal is the proximity to the wildlife, the open space, and those visual impacts and wildlife impacts, in addition to all of the other uh, uh, health impact issues. Um, I guess the one thought I have about that, you know, our society's gotten married, we're getting married to this technology, and we're used to having it everywhere. I talk to patients about, well, your Wi-Fi might be keeping you awake at night, maybe you should turn it off at night. Um, and people think I'm telling them to not have access to the internet. I mean, I've got an internet cable in every room in my house. I'm always plugged in. I just have to unplug and plug my laptop in. I know the most recent cell technologies or operating system technologies are getting set up so that you can go on your cell phone seamlessly from communication with the tower to communication with Wi-Fi in your house. And it might be possible that just communicating to your own Wi-Fi router within your house would give you enough connectivity to do your job and that you don't need to do the job in the backyard, but you can be in the house. So, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to second guess your specific situation, but to me, the issue is that this technology has been developed without being tested on human beings. There's increasingly strong reference, re recognition that there are risks. And I think once people start accepting the possibility that there are risks, then we start adding that to the equation of trying to figure out what the solutions are. Um, and that adds a facet to the equation. That's my goal, is to get people to look at that and think maybe uh, being able to do anything anywhere on a cell phone is something that we're going to have to figure out another solution to because it's not safe for our society, it's not safe for our children and our grandchildren. So, so that's not a complete answer to that question, but I think that when you put that down in the equation, then you start looking for answers and start looking. There are more choices on the multiple choice list. Okay, Pete, this uh, question is for you. Uh, <clears throat> about possible disincentives that the county could impose uh, to simply discourage uh, cell towers in inappropriate places. And one that occurs to me is insurance. Uh, something, as of last year, I think there was something like 60% of insurance companies were refusing to insure cell phone companies at all. So my guess is the insurance costs could be pretty high. And if the county were to impose a condition that the owner uh, indemnify the county and, and insure the property for a, a very high limit, that would, could certainly be a disincentive. Another would be in the case of a church, uh, if you could disallow the tax-exempt status of the church once they're basically a profit-making business. Um, on the topic of, of insurance requirements, I do think that the uh, code, whether it's a Eugene code or a Lane County code, should have uh, adequate insurance because I'm, I'm concerned about another thing, which really hasn't been mentioned yet, and that is if we develop this technology and put up all these cell phone towers in a 20-year period and we saturate the whole country with cell phone towers and then the technology changes, who's gonna remove all these cell phone towers? And so I think the insurance is also a bonding component, which is that when it's not in use, it gets removed. And that's another component besides insurance uh, for it. We do this in the case of, uh, of, of certain other kinds of bonding requirements for structures to make sure that they're removed when they're uh, done with. Uh, the other point, I think, is, is a good one, too, about whether or not we're going to be able to uh, properly uh, uh, implement an idea of, of, of the public's right to know, right to know a lot more information about this process. 
Hi, my name is Alan, and uh, I came here for two reasons. One, to support my local community for people who are being exposed to these things and have to fight for that. Um, we're all responsible because it's our community for that. So I came here to support them. And I also came here to see if I could learn more information about this here. Um, I just want to speak for myself that 15 years ago, the first time I held a cell phone, I didn't feel well. And I decided in my life not to use it. And to this day, I don't have a cell phone. Um, but with this community here, there's a lot of statistics, and really what I want, we, we came here, and I just want to speak about human intelligence, okay? We feel that we need statistics, we need professionals to tell us how we feel and what's right and wrong, okay? Just, so we're looking at all these statistics, right? How many people here in the room have a high school diploma? Okay, we say that's pretty intelligent, right? Based on this evening presentation, how many people in this room feel that we should not have this in our community? Okay, we are intelligent and we gotta stop thinking and get out of the box and stand up in numbers and say, we don't want it. We don't have to have any reason to get sick about it because we are getting sick about it. It's time to double the population every time at meetings like this and say no and let Eugene lead the way. And thank you so much for sharing your statistics. I, I'm Mark. Um, there seems to be, the whole issue of the cell tower seems to revolve around coverage. There's some companies that have good coverage according to the neighborhood and some that have bad. Why is that not a consideration? Why can we not ask all the cell companies to use common towers? Um, and that would do away with any of this need. I think uh, another factor in a better ordinance would be the co-location because we don't need to have more towers if we can get the coverage uh, and we can get them away from people. Hi, my name is Mary Wood and I teach environmental law and I just want to thank the organizers of this meeting and the speakers for a very informative meeting. Um, I had a question for Commissioner Sorensen. I also had a quick, quick comment, first of all, and that is, um, you know, you talked about the legal resistance, and there's legal resistance, there's also community resistance, and those are really two separate tracks, and we've heard sort of st strategies that people use on both tracks, and I, I just want to say I fully agree with you about the law. Um, I read, I'm not an expert in this field, but I did read the law quickly before I came, and I don't see how it could fully preempt a local decision to deny um, a permit for a cell, tone, a cell phone tower. I just don't. So I, th I believe what you say, that the local officials are told that because it's the easy thing to be told. But a legal analysis is far more nuance, nuanced than that. So for the people who lost the battle that they were fighting regarding the cell tower that is already in existence, um, might I just say that that is often the case until you know, um, a, a local campaign grows. So my question, um, after having said that, is what is the process at the city level for dealing with this issue? Because it seems like the commission has dealt with it, but I don't, I haven't really heard where the city is at. And the second part of the question would be, do citizens prompt a sort of process to start considering these issues at the city level? Because it's not just this neighborhood, it's going to be a matrix um, across pretty much the whole city if Eugene patterns itself after Portland's experience. Thanks. Uh, is your uh, Bill Moyers thing public or am I about to make it public? <laughs> I guess you're What you to... need to know about Professor Wood is that as a result of her scholarship and activism, she was recently interviewed by Bill Moyers uh, in New York on his television show and it'll be uh, forthcoming when uh, shown on public television, so it's a phenomenal achievement, and she's been at the forefront of protecting the climate worldwide, so uh, thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs> uh, as far as uh, the answer to your question, I, I think that the uh, code is, is better understood by some of the folks in the room, like Ms. Allen, who I've met with, and, you know, again, there is a process, applicants, make applications, 
we have a right as citizens to look at those applications. That application has been made in the case of the crossfire, uh, specifically that one. It's been made, it's been ruled as inadequate by city staff, and they're about to have a ruling on that because they have tentatively concluded that the applicant has failed to submit the proper documentation. Uh, I have been in touch with Ms. Taylor, not Councilor Betty Taylor, but Ms. Becky Taylor, who uh, is a land use uh, official with the city of Eugene. And, and I would invite anybody in the group to contact Ms. Allen uh, or Becky uh, Taylor at the city of Eugene on the status of that particular um, one of the things in the city code is an independent analysis, and they have not submitted an independent analysis. They have not paid for an independent analysis. The city has not done an independent analysis, and I have made a formal request to obtain a copy of the currently non-existent independent analysis, just to remind them that there are people looking at this process, and uh, maybe that will be a, a, a factor in the decision of the city to deny it. Uh, no, I, I, I wanted to make it clear that was re regarding the crossfire uh, application. I believe they will, and I would encourage you to contact Ms. Uh, Becky Taylor at the city. And oh, okay. Okay, Zach Galloway is her successor. And I would recommend you talk to Ms. Allen because she's been immersed in this on the crossfire application. You know, when, uh, at the last uh, um, city um, neighborhood meeting, Becky Taylor was there, and she described the process, which was really quite concerning because they, the company can there's some words she used, she, they can push it, they can insist, even without uh, providing all this information. And then the lawyer from Portland is gonna pass on whether or not the application to put it through or not. And it could happen like the, over this winter holiday when we're not paying attention, which is why uh, this meeting is happening now with such short notice, because this, is, this tower could, could get approved soon, like within weeks. There, there are lots of um, detail type questions and, and those of us who uh, are involved in that, some of those questions will be hanging out here after this meeting. Let's see if we can um, have any more final questions for our speakers and then the rest of us will stick around because we should wrap up in a few minutes. I just have um, two brief points. One is that eWeb is planning to install digital smart meters, electric smart meters, which are like having mini cell towers attached to your home. So I just wanted to make that clear as part of this cell tower conversation. The other thing I want to do is, is um, in support of what you were saying about the FCC, um, there are a couple of court cases that I'd like to quote. One is Norton versus Shelby. Uh, an unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no rights, it imposes no duties, affords no protection, it creates no office, it is in legal contemplation uh, and in op as inoperative as though it had never been passed. And the other one is Miranda versus U.S., where rights secured by the Constitution are involved there can be no rulemaking or legislation would, which would abrogate them. So those are two very powerful court cases that we can use in this situation. Say it again. Oh, I don't have the years here, but people can look them up. One is Norton versus Shelby and the other one is Miller, uh, sorry. Um, Miranda versus U.S., which is a famous one that gives us our Miranda rights. Uh, just a quick follow-up, and that is that University of California Berkeley Law Review article uh, cites a number of cases where communities have uh, 
uh, been able to pass, and this is nationwide, not just Oregon, but to overcome the, uh, uh, the idea that, that the Federal Telecommunications Act is a total prohibition against local. So there's, there's plenty of cases out there. Um, good. Uh, just have a couple things. One is uh, the public schools have in Eugene have invested a lot of money in computers for every child. Now they're doing iMaps or whatever, um, iPads for every child. Kindergarten on up. And there's computer labs outside the rooms that they wheel in and each child is, is Wi-Fi. So that's an issue um, that I, I feel like all of this is really an issue that needs to be more education out to the community and thank you to everyone who has promoted education and written letters and done what they can because we're behind in catching up on this kind of. And the other question I have is related to that. Um, Professor Soper said something about uh, debating the research and so even though I agree with the person who said we don't have to have everything researched that the, the precautionary principle could be at play here rather than proof. Still, we're in a system that where if you have the research, you have power. So I'm curious about that too. Well, um, <clears throat> what we've heard, uh, I mean, when I was talking to eWeb, they wanted to present both sides of the equation and they hired someone with a master's in physics from uh, uh, MIT or Harvard to get on the phone uh, on the internet and talk and he talked a lot about what was logical from the point of view of physics and the forces involved and how this wasn't ionizing radiation. He didn't talk about any studies. Um, what we've heard over the last 10 years from uh, uh, the telecom industry is there really isn't any significant research, any significant number of scientists who are concerned. Um, my goal in presenting this is to collect a lot of what I consider the most significant current research. I mean, you can go to the Bioinitiative Report and get 2,900 pages of pretty much everything anybody's ever published on this since 1980. And I read that when I was preparing this. I looked at over 600 articles in detail as I reviewed them for this. Um, so once you've got some admission there is research, then people can start arguing over which research is more significant. Um, I think the point I was trying to make in regards to the arguments of physics is that this is a problem, this is a biological issue, and it's not just a matter of the power of the signal, it's a matter of the response. The force involved in a yellow jacket sticking its stinger into you is negligible, but if you have an anaphylactic reaction to it, that's a pretty severe response. That's not caused by the yellow jacket, that's caused by your immune system. That's your mistake, you know. But, but um, when you start talking about biology, it changes the equation. And a lot of the arguments I hear about the logic of this, the polemics I see online and discussion groups are by people who keep saying, well, the signal in, de decreases with the square of the distance and it's not strong enough to break covalent bonds. Therefore, it's impossible for this to cause any problem. There's no way that the research supports that. The current research clearly shows that, that RF in living tissues increases oxidant stress. And then you can argue about the significance of that. Um, uh, I guess that's all I have to say about that at this point in time. You know, um, when I was a state senator, I tried to get the uh, Attorney General's office to intervene in a case uh, brought by the state of Mississippi against the tobacco industry to recover damages that taxpayers had had in having to pay the Medicaid costs associated with people addicted to tobacco. And the Attorney General, whose name I won't mention, out of respect for bygone days, the Attorney General said, there's no way we're joining that lawsuit. There's no way we're going to spend money in that lawsuit because that lawsuit will never be successful. There is no proof. There's that awful word from our jurisprudence. There's no proof that the taxpayers lost any money as a result 
of thousands of people, millions of people, smoking and then having taxpayers having to pay for their medical care. And you know what? Mississippi did win that case. And Oregon was not a party to the reimbursement of the millions of dollars that Oregon taxpayers. So here's my prediction. I know this must be an international first. But we are going to look back on this period and say, why didn't we take this seriously? Why did we just keep putting our nose down under the ground, in the ground, in the cow excrement? Why did we keep not looking when we had been warned? Why? And it's because so much cash is spread around the state capital for the tobacco industry and for the cellular telephone industry that the elected leaders aren't yet listening. Okay? And by the way, uh, Mary Adams is here. Stand up, Mary. Mary was one of the people who testified Tuesday at the, what seemed like, 15-hour session of the Lane County Board of Commissioners in favor of regulating e-cigarettes in Lane County, which the board approved on a three-to-two vote. Yeah, I've had uh, headaches and earaches from being around Wi-Fi, and it's gotten really bad for me in the last three months. And I, kept, I used to keep my Wi-Fi by my computer on all the time. So I had it on for years, and now I've just gone over the edge with it. So my headache got worse just being by some people having the Wi-Fis on with their computers here tonight and all this other stuff, you know, the sound bop. But I have questions for both of you. Dr. Dart, my understanding is that American citizens are taking antidepressants and psychoactive drugs to deal with all the distress that they're in at five times the rate they were in 2000. And I wanted to ask you if that's true and if you think that might be connected with all these towers that have gone up in the last 15 years. And Commissioner Sorensen, I live close to the rail yard. I'm about six blocks away in the Lower River Road area. There's a big tower in the rail yard. I think it's 320 feet high. And they've put new strobes on that about a year ago. Also, I've noticed that the trains that are coming through our community, they have new, louder horns. And they got louder maybe about a year ago. But, you know, they're loud at midnight. They're loud at 4 AM. I've lived in my home there for 13 years. Never woke up with the train. But now the train is loud enough to wake me up with those horns at night. Are you, is that, are you aware of that tower? And I wonder how many antennas are on that tower, because there's quite a few of them. There's a lot of different individuals and corporations that are working that tower. And I do think that question about why Americans are taking so many antidepressants and different drugs is, is very pertinent to this uh, topic. Okay. Well, even though my job might imply I know something about antidepressants, I will say <laughs> I'll leave that to Dr. Dart. Uh, regarding the train noise, uh, you know, I, I held a town hall meeting in Whitaker about uh, two years ago on the topic of train noise and whether or not the Federal Railroad uh, Act does preempt local governments from enacting uh, uh, reasonable regulations regarding the sound. And once again, we're hitting the same issue of whether or not a federal rule, a federal uh, concern for interstate commerce uh, conflicts with what a local community wants to do. I, I will say that um, uh, we do have a right to uh, continually raise this issue. I'm not aware that the noise from the trains or from the whistles from the trains is louder, so that is new to me. Um, uh, I would like to know more about that. I don't know about that specific tower, and is it for railroad communications? Because they have their own internal communications, or is it a cell, cell phone tower on the railroad property in the River Road? Uh, okay. You'll see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, I would be happy to look into it. I. Okay. I'd be happy to look into it, and I do believe that, again, when 
when a, and Mayor Piercy and I have worked on this as well, that when a local community is told you can't regulate it because of a federal rule or federal regulation, once again, it's really up to us as to how far we want to push that because health and safety and, uh, and, and the environment and, and, and public welfare are within the powers of local government. So we just need to assert that. I'm unaware of any actual research data that could put a number on what you're talking about. No, no, no. It, the question you asked, yeah, I mean, I don't know the stats on that. I know that since I came out of medical school, the two top selling drugs in the United States usually are a drug to treat anxiety and a drug to treat insomnia. And that's been the case for many, many years. An awful lot of people are having trouble sleeping whether they're not taking drugs for it. Uh, and if you look at the symptoms that people who have electrohypersensitivity syndrome, if you look at the symptoms they've got, it's not hard to infer from that that there's a lot of people with less debilitating levels of problems with sleep that may be caused by RF. If you could hear your Wi-Fi router, if you could hold a Wi-Fi, a tool up to it that measured the sound, I mean measured the, the, the transmission frequencies and transliterated it into a sound wave, this is what your Wi-Fi router sounds like. If I can get my sound to work. And it's doing that, that the Wi-Fi protocol transmits constantly, whether or not it's being used. Um, so the Wi-Fi routers they're putting in, into the schools, they're putting live wire into every room in the schools in Eugene. And there's a big incentive from the federal government to create uh, uh, educational materials to bring kids in the 20th century or 21st century and all that, but they're transmitting constantly. That's part of the problem, constant transmissions, especially at night is a big part of the problem. Um, I didn't present research, some research showing effects on hormones, effects on stress hormones uh, from this. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, uh, so I think that for me as a clinician, I'm aware from watching my patients and from having my patients make various experiments that there are a lot of people having trouble sleeping that if they reduce the RF in their home, it'll make a difference. Um, I haven't I haven't researched that, so you're not going to get a, a response from Dr. Dart on that because as a physician, I can't comment on research I haven't studied. Um, I can say that doctors that practice environmental medicine who are working a lot with people who have chronic problems like this, uh, at this point in time, a lot of the doctors I know that are working in that way think that this problem is going to be worse in terms of public health than what cigarettes did to America in the 20th century. And that we're, we're, we're driving towards a real serious problem. Now, sooner or later, we'll know. 
And science starts with hypothesis, evidence gradually builds, people look at it, see if it makes sense. Sooner or later, there's a consensus. And sooner or later, we'll have a consensus on, on what the validity of all this is one way or the other. By then, we may be you know, deep into a very hot pot of water. Okay, mine's gonna be the last comment, said William. I wanna say for those people who still have their cell phones on, I pretty much stopped using mine a year and a third ago, by the way, but I still have it. But you have to put it on airplane mode, stop the transmissions, otherwise you're creating the need for more cell phone towers. And finally, I just wrote to five legislators a couple uh, days ago in Oregon, I asked them to change the 20 year law that they have to have a 20 year uh, uh, law for industrial lands and residential. And those people who are moving out to the country, if you think you're going to get the same kind of cell phone and internet service there, then maybe you shouldn't be out in the country and you should stay in the city. Thanks. <laughs> and with that, I want to thank our guests, Commissioner Pete Sorensen and Dr. Dart. Thank you all for your for your questions and your attention. And if you would like to be notified of future developments, please uh, sign one of the uh, notification lists here. And take the handouts, too. Thank you.